Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the first ever um, History Reclaimed webinar. And thanks to all of you who uh, have been supporting us, whether financially or by reading uh, our, um, our, our publications and also by writing to us quite frequently. Uh, and um, without you, this would not be possible. But we're going to, um, as you, you may know, at least I hope you know, as you've signed into today's webinar, that we're going to have a series of webinars on some of the most important and controversial historical topics uh, which form today's uh, public debates. And to start us off, we're very pleased to have Professor Doug Stokes, who is Professor at the Development Strategy and Security Institute at the University of Exeter, and the author of an excellent book, I know it's excellent because I've read it in, 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 in TypeScript, on, which is called Against Decolonization and subtitled The Campus Culture Wars and the Decline of the West. And he today is going to give us a sort of general introduction to set the scene, to provide us with a context for all of our future web, webinar series. Uh, and we're very grateful to him for, for doing that. And um, what we're going to do is, is to have Doug speaking for about half an hour. And then for you, ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask questions. And to do that, please use your chat command to write your questions in. And I shall then see them and I'll be able to select the questions and pass them on to, to Professor Stokes. So without any more delay, I'm going to ask him now to begin and to set the scene for, well, for, for, our, for our Culture Wars set webinars. Thank you very much, Robert, and it's an absolute pleasure to be here, uh, and not least to be the first speaker on this webinar series, I and mean, history claimed upon some fantastic things, so I'm really, really very much honoured. Uh, I'm not an academic historian, I should put that up, up, up front, and my main specialism is in international security and strategy, but I have written some, quite a lot of stuff around issues around decolonization. And, um, and as Robert said, my new book comes out next year, which looks at the role of decolonization across British institutions. Uh, uh, and, and also I doing also engage with the history and sort of the historical narratives of that kind of ideological movement that falls upon. I think it's a very interesting kind of uh, a series of, of ideas. So today's speech, so today's talk then will, will basically be on, be on decolonization and essentially some of the key claims that it makes. Uh, and then I'll briefly touch upon some of the, um, the history that it draws upon. And then I'll look at the, the final sort of part of the, of the speech will be on the ideological effect of decolonization. And this can then set the frame of, kind of the later historical debates that we'll be examining in this webinar series. So essentially, especially after the, the, the sort of post George Floyd, we've seen uh, a movement emerge in British universities in particular, a very strong movement calling for the decolonization of British history and for decolonization of British institutions. Uh, and this, this essentially draws upon various academic theories, mostly kind of postmodern and post-colonial theories. So Foucault and Derrida and, and, and Ibn Said and et cetera. This kind of developing body and kind of developing mature body, in fact, of, of academic work in this in this area that, that sort of draws upon this idea, kind of postmodern ideas of the role of knowledge and, and knowledge production and how basically knowledge can impose its own sort of sets of power relationships upon the world. So the sort of the key claim basically, therefore, then is that in the West, at least in the UK, we have uh, these legacy effects of these imperial and colonial discourses and ideological ways of understanding the world. We are ultimately have to deconstruct these um, uh, uh, ideas and these discourses, and in so doing, also deconstruct, uh, in many senses, Western civilization and some of the assumptions upon which Western hegemony rests upon. Uh, and so, and so, in inherent to this decolonizing uh, ideology are various sets of claims, um, and the first one. And, and sort of more quite popularly put by Kehinde Andrews, a professor at Birmingham, uh, talks about the idea of the West, and, and it's quite a common discourse, in fact, is the West is founded on genocide, slavery, and colonialism. So there's almost a kind of, uh, a very much of castigation of Western history, and the view, at least, that the West, Western civilization, and the UK, and the Anglophone world in particular, America as well, but also the UK, is founded on a system of ultimately racialized, hierarchical racialized injustice. 
more broadly uh, from that, and again, drawing on kind of postmodern ideas about the tainted nature of the Enlightenment, and in particular, it rejects, it sees the Enlightenment less about kind of progressing civilization, progressing humanity, and sees the tools of the Enlightenment. So, for example, reason, rationality, science, and even the quest for truth and objectivity and scientific understanding, it sees these kind of within a postmodern framework as very much as kind of tools of oppression and this process of the imposition of a dominant Western way of seeing the world on the, on, on the oppressed of the world, essentially. Now, in the book, and Robert and I have discussed this quite in detail too, but in the book, I kind of argue that this in many ways, uh, this, this kind of what is often pejorative, pejoratively and popularly called woke or intersectionality or decolonization, really is it kind of it, it conforms very strongly to almost a kind of quasi-religious script uh, and it's, it's noticeable in particular that we see these ideas very strongly in the anglophone um, 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 states in uh, america and uk in particular and i would argue there's a very kind of almost like a sort of, a post, sort of protestant element to this kind of quasi uh, uh, sort of cultural script that we're now seeing within elite within elite culture and within within british institutions so, for example, you have the original sin of, of Western civilization itself, uh, and how, how do you uh, absolve yourself of the sin? Ultimately, you have to confess. There's a confession of whiteness, white privilege, uh, and, and through that process of confession, you become an ally, then an ally to the, to the oppressed of the world, ultimately. It kind of also within this, this kind of dominant decolonizing worldview, if you will, uh, it posits the various structural evils at work. So there's kind of, it, so the structural racism is 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 is, is ubiquitous, uh, and then there are various sacralized groups within this dominant, uh, with hegemonic ideology, uh, sort of sacralized groups, often historically oppressed minorities that will ultimately be saved by the enlightened saviors, in particular, mostly white progressives and white liberals within institutions that will save and sort of deliver and sort of deliver redemption, if you will. So this is almost kind of a redemptive moment of utopian equity through institutional decolonization. So you have then a very sort of a kind of emergent uh, ideological uh, hegemony now. We're seeing it in the, the very strongly within the university system, but also across British institutions, particularly cultural institutions, of this of this argument for decolonization rests as it is upon a kind of postmodern epistemology. A rejection of, of the Enlightenment tradition of reason, science, and truth, seen as almost tools of white supremacy, and a, and a, and a kind of, and in particular, a very kind of almost very one-sided view of British history. Essentially, so it kind of history of the, of the UK, history of Great Britain is seen as tainted and is based upon sort of genocide, slavery, and colonialism. And from and from that kind of the moral force of the argument, that historical narrative, that kind of gives the kind of the, the political impetus. For this process of decolonization is a very powerful set of discursive tools, if you will. So I'll just briefly then talk about some of the, I mean, again, these, uh, some, some of the ideas and some of the historical aspects of this. Uh, and I should also say these are also very, you know, interesting debates. But so the first obvious point to make about British history, and this will be discussed in later webinars too, is that extraterritorial conquest and slavery have characterized human history. Uh, so, I mean, extraterritorial conquest, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's nothing unique to the, to, to the UK uh, in relation to extraterritorial conquest, as we see now, for example, in, um, in Ukraine with Russia's uh, uh, special military operation in Ukraine. Again, slavery has also been ubiquitous throughout human history. So essentially, yeah, the, I think the International Labour Organization has concluded that in, in today there's, there's 36 million uh, slaves in today's, uh, in today's um, world. Uh, the majority of which are in India, but also Qatar is a major slave state. So essentially, so the, the, the point there really is that slavery doesn't necessarily doesn't belong to one country or one civilization. It's been ubiquitous throughout human history. And we need to bear that in mind when, when we talk about the slave trade and Britain's role in it. Also, the second point that you, we should think about, and again, this will be developed in later weeks, um, is, is, the, is, is the pre-existence of slavery within the African continent itself. The dominant view tends to basically be the dominant narrative that was, that was the decolonizing narrative, is that um, Europeans all basically were responsible for the slave trade within Africa. 
but that's just not the that's just not the case. I mean, essentially, intra-African slavery was ubiquitous throughout Africa. Slaves tended to be taken as a result of, of, of conquest and through war. Victors would take slaves as part of their bounty system, essentially. So intra-African slavery existed uh, throughout the African African continent prior to European uh, contact. And again, we're, we're, slaves were taken as a result of conquest and war. Similarly, there was a very advanced and, uh, and mature Arab slave trade throughout Africa as well. Um, uh, prior prior to, um, to to European contact, so and and various, and there were various African slave kingdoms. So, for example, Dahomey, the D Kingdom of Dahomey was a was a slave society. Sokoto Caliphate in, in what is now Nigeria was a massive um, slave society. Uh, essentially, about two two point five three million slaves working on the plantations there. And obviously, and most obviously, in relation to European history, we have Barbary slavery. So, the Barbary slave states. Of Algeria, Libya, Tunisia, essentially pr practiced uh, piracy and, and slavery, and mainly raided off the coasts of uh, the, the Western European nations. So uh, mainly off the, so I think they, at one point they got as far as Iceland, for example. And estimates vary, but broadly speaking, between one to two million uh, white slaves were taken as a result of Barbary slavery. And indeed, the US, uh, one of its first naval wars ever, was launched against the Barbary slave trade slave trade to end the Barbary slavery. So essentially then the point, major point there is that slavery isn't uh, a, a kind of a British invention. There was extensive slavery throughout Africa prior to European contact. There were numerous African kingdoms based upon slavery and obviously and Europe itself, uh, this country has been subject to, 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 to slave raids, most notably the Barbary slave trade. The third point in relation to sort of contesting some of the ideas of the decolonizing narrative, at least, is the British role in ending slavery. And again, there's, there's a fantastic webinar that we have in a couple of weeks on, on this series. But obviously, um, the, the British, so essentially 200 years of the transatlantic slave trade, but then uh, this country banned the slave trade and then went about ultimately eliminating it from, uh, from large parts of the, of the world. So, for example, by the, in the 1840s, there were about 35 anti-slavery ships off the coast of West Africa. And the slave trade to Brazil, the largest market in the Southern Hemisphere, was ended by the Royal Navy. So, again, it's something we need to be cognizant of when we think about British history and the role of, of the UK within that, the, the broader milieu of transatlantic slavery and, and the Britain's role of ending slavery. A fourth major point in relation to some of the decolonizing claims about British history is, is like, um, if you look at some of the academic literature, so for example, Eltis and Engelman, and I think I'll, I'll be making a, a, some slides available that I think will be distributed by History Reclaimed, and I can, I'm, I'll put references within them. But there's a, some fantastic work, for example, done by Eltis and Engelman, who look at some of the economic data in relation to the, the, the British British commerce and its, and its role in, in transatlantic slavery. And so that they, they, they argue, for example, in 1792, which is the most significant year transatlantic slavery in the British economy, 1.5% of British ships and 3% of tonnage were involved in the slave trade overall. And they quote, if, if, quote, economic activity on so modest a scale could contribute significantly to industrialization, then we might expect Europe's first industrial economy to have been Portugal and not Britain. In other words, industrialization and British wealth isn't linked to the slave trade per se. And there's quite, there's quite a lot of uh, literature on that. I mean, there's extensive literature, in fact, and so, and and so, there we see then. So, essentially, is is industrialization, is science, is British history all based upon the, the wealth of, of slavery? Well, the academic literature again is highly contested, but it would seem to indicate that this is really not the case. Uh, what what is undoubtable I and mean, uncontestable is that the wealth of the, a tiny elite within the UK, no doubt, made or well, did make huge amounts of money from the transatlantic slave trade. So, for example. In 1833, uh, about 20 million uh, was made, was given over to those that are participating in the slave trade. It was about 3,000 people, essentially, which was in 40% of the entire budget to pull them out of the slave trade itself, essentially, for sort of a payment to sort of compensate them. As, as distasteful as that is to us in the present day, it was altered to, to sort of accelerate the ending of the transatlantic slave trade by basically paying them off to sort of pacify their, 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 their very powerful uh, uh, interests within the British, within Great Britain itself. 
So, so essentially, no doubt, the tiny elite did make a lot of money from the slave trade. There's no doubt about that. But in terms of how that works at the aggregate level and across the UK, not least within the context of mass deprivation, the urban slums, uh, the kind of the, the clearances, etc. So it's not exactly like uh, the entire British population was sipping pina coladas as a result of the, the pernicious trade of, of, of the slave trade. I mean, this idea that this country's wealth is directly related to the slave trade itself is just not the case. That's not what the academic literature says, essentially. So you have to really sort of tease these, these points out a bit more. No doubt a tiny elite did make huge amounts of money, and as distasteful as that is, the British population did not. It wasn't generalised across the British population. And in fact, I think even the, the mortality rate of the British population at the time of the ending of slavery was 40 years old. So I'd be long dead uh, by, by that point. I mean, you need to bear that in mind in terms of a kind of more socioeconomic analysis, of the nature of the British economy, uh, and, th and bear that in mind. So, so, so essentially, then, so we have these kind of these key claims: the de decolonization, this argument about the, the West is kind of uh, deeply implicated in this this terrible legacy, and these ideas, these kind of race racialized ideas and racial hierarchies have legacy effects to the present day. And it rests upon a, a history which is highly contested um, and really is not as black and white as uh, the UK is, is evil uh, and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. It's a far more contested thing. But, this, but this, the problem is this decolonizing uh, narrative, these, these ideas, they, they have kind of broader effects. I mean, obviously in the present day, given the complex history that we have, they have kind of broader political effects in the present day. And it's interesting how, how, what these kind of effects are. So I'll just briefly talk about that now. Some, some of the effects that we might see, and we see this quite a lot, is this kind of collective guilt tripping that we see now across British society, where essentially um, we see the re-emergence of quite casual anti-white racism, in my opinion, and many other people's opinion, that's just emerging. So essentially, institutions, we see this very much in the university system, talk about this idea of whiteness. And in fact, indeed, there's a whole, there's a whole sort of sub-genre called whiteness studies, which essentially seems to basically be, be, to, to talk about the, the role of whiteness as, as a kind of evil and a malign effect. Jahindi Andrews, I think is one of the, as I mentioned it before, is one of the leading critical race theorists. And he's sort of, he's sort of seen as this kind of guru of this kind of broad decolonizing movement talks about whiteness as a, as a psychosis, essentially. So it's, also, it's almost like a psychotic mindset. And so we're, see, so we're seeing this now. So there's a, there's a kind of a, a, a collective guilt tripping uh, of whiteness and, and debates and these ideas around white privilege. And that has, I would argue, has very kind of weakening effects for what is a, a, a very successful multiracial liberal democracy. It kind of, um, it, it, it's very divisive and it's, playing people off against each other. And then when we think about the actual, what the actual data says, so we've got the claims of decolonizing activists that essentially this country right now is a kind of deeply racist. But if you actually look at the opinion polling and you actually look at the data, it just doesn't bear this out in any way. So for example, some of the highest earners in, in the UK are, uh, are, are from ethnic minorities. China, I think Chinese work with Chinese men now out earn Chinese, white men by 30%. Indians also some of the highest educational out outcomes. Um, again, even in with the university sector, it's very diverse. There's an overrepresentation of BAME students, which is I think is, is a great thing, you know, within the university sector, essentially. So this, this idea that everything's characterized by systemic racism and structural whiteness just isn't the case. And in fact, as we as most people will know now, essentially the people that are asked in the university sector at least most locked out of it are the white working class there's been a historic and decades long now underrepresentation of the white working class with the british higher education so it's kind of an interesting mix we've got kind of academics uh, arguing that essentially there's a kind of deep we need to decolonize even further and diversify even further in in the context of already a very diverse uh, higher education system but also uh, but then this kind of collective guilt tripping of, of, of endorsing ideas around white privilege and, and whiteness, when the data shows that some of the most disadvantaged people are white working class people in particular. 
Um, the, the second major kind of ideological effect, I think, of decolonizing is it's kind of a, it, it reinforces almost a kind of narcissistic Eurocentrism. Ironically, they argue they want decenter Europe, decenter Eurocentrism. But I think it almost is it's kind of a narcissistic uh, recentering of, 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 of Europe. It kind of essentially it, it reinforces this idea that Europe is, has been the center of the world. And it reinforces this kind of this, 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 this dominant hegemonic critique that we see of colonialism and imperialism. So it reinforces, I think, the, the, the view that the, the global south has just been acted upon. It's almost like they, it doesn't have its own histories, complex histories, its complex civilizations and complex uh, cultures, or, or even like their own instrumental interests, in fact. So essentially, it raises large chunks of, of, of global history, of world history, and to reinforce a very kind of like a, a kind of one-sided Eurocentric view of, of, of uh, the West as this uh, perfidious and, and malign influence on world history. I mean, one only has to look, for example, at the role of the Ottoman Empire. I mentioned earlier on, for example, the Barbary states. I mean, the Barbary, the Barbary states became part of the Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Empire's navy, the Ottoman Empire just got to Eastern Europe. I mean, huge chunks of Eastern Europe were colonized by the by the Ottoman Empire. European state formation was intimately bound up with processes of Ottoman expansion and and and, and dissolution. So again, we, we I think the call for my from from history with claim I think will, is that we need to sort of see the world in, in this complex mix, and we can't keep infantilizing non-European people and placing Europe at the center of everything. We have to sort of see the world warts and all, and other cultures and other civilizations. A third major element I think that is really related to the decolonizing thing is it, it, it is we've seen this in the universities, we've seen this across British institutions, the National Trust, in the church, etc. It's this kind of moral panic around racism, in particular after the George, the, the shocking killing of George Floyd. Right. And, and this, I think, then gives rise to uh, it re-energizes the power of technocrats within the, within these institutions to follow through, and what I'd argue is a kind of form of therapeutic authoritarianism, where essentially uh, vulnerable populations have to be protected and 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 essentially coddled from these sets of uh, kind of ubiquitous, but very hard to spot evils, structural things, etc., uh, out there. So, in, in a sense, then the, the, the ideological effect of this decolonizing movement and the broader kind of wokery that it that it that it calls upon really is to advance, I think, the bureaucratic power of technocrats and kind of creeping authoritarianism uh, wrapped around a, poli a politics of vulnerability. So essentially, we have these vulnerable populations that we have to intervene on, basically. So it essentially re-energizes the moral authority and the moral energy of those that are running Br British institutions. Essentially, it's kind of it, it kind of a virtue, a process of virtue signaling, but also an instrumental power seeking too. We have to extend our remit. We have to extend our power, chase out these demons that exist out there, in a form of therapeutic authoritarianism, which has all kinds of highly liberal effects. Uh, so, for example, one, we see, for example, now across British institutions, this kind of unconscious bias training all the time. We have to un undergo kind of reprogramming of your mind microaggressions as well it's kind of another kind of like very odd concept where essentially you have uh, all these microaggressions that exist and if you look at some of the data on this stuff i mean literally a micro a microaggression can be anything from the way you look at somebody or the way you stand or so essentially it's, it's kind of it's, it's kind of highly illiberal what we're seeing now this new racial moral panic this, this politics of decolonizing and drawing up on this history garbled history, in my opinion, essentially is leading to new forms of therapeutic authoritarianism. I think it's very dangerous and illiberal therapeutic authoritarianism within British institutions, but I think it's very dangerous. And the fourth point, I'll end on this point because my time is running out, is we also have to recognise that Western civilization, the UK, if you look at the actual opinion polling data, and not what you read in Guardian headlines, the UK is one of the least racist societies on earth. Essentially, and that's very well borne out. Opinion poll after opinion polls are incredibly diverse, incredibly inclusive, and incredibly uh, 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 open and tolerant society. Okay, um, but also we, we have to recognise. So, so essentially, we have been a kind of progressive arc in British history, moving towards much more kind of progressive attitudes and anti-discrimination norms, which is a great thing. 
essentially. But we're also existing within a broader international system, where, for, whereby, for example, we see now that the, that the shift in economic power away from the West, we're kind of entering into a, a sort of post-liberal uh, global order, part, part, partially related to Russia's aggression in Ukraine, but also the rise of China. So essentially, we, therefore, then, we, we, the UK, we, we're no longer in this kind of era of, of American unipolarity. So essentially, the, the West geopolitics underpinned by American power. And the irony is, a lot of this stuff you see from the decolonizing and, the, and, and, and more broadly the sort of woke ideology is predicated on the, upon American unipolarity, which is now shifting. So essentially, the institutional settlement that we have enjoyed in the West and in the UK as well in the post-war international system is now shifting as, as China rises and great power competition comes back. So interestingly, and again, the book touches upon this, is we've seen the deliberate weaponization of, of wokery and these ideas of decolonizing by essentially as part of influence campaigns by highly liberal states. So, so the, the major point is this, if the UK is one of the least racist, most progressive uh, civilizations we, we have had in human history, very diverse, very inclusive, look at the norms, look at the opinion polling data, and yet we have the rise of highly liberal authoritarian states, which are highly technologically capable, by the way, and a shift in the economic center of gravity away from the West to a China centered, for example, East Asia. So in, in other words, great power competition is, is coming back. Uh, a prerequisite for the, for the potential for us to kind of defend our, our civilization, defend the broader international system is a degree of civilizational confidence. And I think that's why the work that history would claim is doing is so important. It's about pushing back against these kind of highly divisive narratives that rest ultimately, I think, on, a, on, a, on an institutional settlement, a post-war international institutional settlement that is now radically changing. So in, in other words, you need to be careful what you wish for. If you really want to decolonize and deconstruct the West, then what waits in the wings? Thank you. I'll leave it there. Rob, I think you're on mute. <sighs> Thanks very much, Doug, for a, a very rich um, uh, uh, presentation, which is a great deal that we can discuss, and, and we indeed we will discuss for a few minutes, uh, if if you're willing to give us the time. Um, and I, uh, I'm allowed to ask the first question, I think. So I'm going to ask you to be a, a, a more, let's say, more brutally frank about one of the things that you've sort of alluded to, and that's to say, who is it who benefits from? this uh from this this trend this decolonization fashion and i wonder if you think it's 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 real motive power comes from sort of psychology you know you talked about collective guilt tripping or from politics maybe pol political interest in pushing this or from um some sort of a, a sort of is there a sociological explanation to who are the kinds of people who are benefiting from this both D d well, domestically, I suppose I'm asking now because you've already su suggested that the people who are who are benefiting in the international arena are not our friends. So, you know, who who who's what's pushing this? Do you think, and who's benefiting from it? Well, I, I think that this is a you know you have to look at these things in in the round, and this multi-layered monocause analysis never works, right? If I, if I was going to give you my absolute brutal answer to this, I would say that it's related to whole sets of things. The first thing I think is, is I think that human beings on a kind of, uh, on, on a deep level have to have a sense of meaning, right? What I would say, you know, meaning uh, in, gives you a, a, a sense of directionality. And I think in our society now, we do have a loss of traditional values, a loss of spirituality, uh, and it's, it's, it's about the individual and it's kind of hyper-liberalism, right? So I think that, and I, I did sort of mention, I think that the kind of wokery that we see now, it, it has a very strong, I'd say a sort of Protestant script within it, almost Calvinistic, you know, one of punishment and abasement and redemption through allyship, etc. So it follows a kind of like a sort of, but I think, I think on that level, I think that you have, on a meta level, you have a kind of... Um, whether it's unconscious or a deeper transcendental, transcendental level, this this search for meaning. So I think this the, this I, this ideology gives you that, that certainty. It's very much a black and white world. It gives you a sense of place. 
to give you a sense of political directionality. So I think you've got that. I think that's a, that's kind of the deeper human malaise that I think we, we see that help to drive this, number one. I think then also you have uh, just a collapse, really, of traditional authority within institutions. Uh, I think that um, we, 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 part of this is, is a rejection of, uh, of authority, you know, essentially, if you buy the Foucauldian idea that everything is about knowledge and there's no such thing as truth or Robert Toombs has no more right to talk about the history of France than Joe Bloggs down the road. I mean, who's who's he? He's just a he's all just a white guy. And, he, you know, it's all about power and there's no truth anyway. You see what I mean? So so if we buy that philosophical argument, which is ultimately a claim about epistemology, right, then everything becomes horizontalized. So, so therefore, then we we have the collapse of of truth. We have the collapse of, of of intellectual authority, and I think that that's part of this kind of deeper uh, postmodern transformation within the social sciences and humanities, which have been bubbling along now for decades and sort of spewed out millions of graduates, and that now has spread, I think, th throughout society to quite a large extent. So, I think that that's also part of it. And then you have the classic kind of grifters and people within it. So, you know. As I, as I kind of alluded to, you've got institutions that I think want to re-energize themselves. In, in, in sort of the, they, they've got a collapse in some senses of the traditional role. So they re-energize themselves through this, through this form of kind of virtue signaling and this kind of moral certainty. You know, I mean, it, sometimes it reaches absolutely ridiculous proportions that we've seen, for example, in Qatar recently with, the, with multi-millionaire footballers taking the money from Qatar uh, and but wearing an armband, kind of woke capital well, capitalism, this kind of thing. So it's gonna. So I think I think that's part of it too. And then and then also on a micro level, you get people, and, and there's also a kind of a deeper kind of legal legal value uh, uh, matrix that underpins this in the UK. So for example, we have for example the Equality Act. We can go into that if you want to talk about the Equality Act. But the old Equality Act has certain elements to it: the public sector equality duty in section one four nine. That really has provided the, the, the sort of the beachhead upon which a lot of wokery has really kind of infected institutions. In other words, people have used the very specific interpretations, bad interpretations of that law to push through these EDI bureaucracies and these kind of broader changes. So it's kind of a, it's, it's related to a whole, I think, a whole range of issues. Uh, well, thanks. Um, now, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to ask a question, write in using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, somebody has written in to ask um, whether you think, and I think you do think this, because I think this is something that you were saying, is decolonization would be better described as de-westernization. And maybe I could follow that up by saying, how is it possible for people who are pushing this line to really to be denying, it seems to me, that there is such a thing as universal universal ideas which they associate with the enlightenment and with colonial oppression and yet they're, they're pushing their own ideas as being of universal validity is it is it sort of saying nobody's ideas are true except my ideas uh, but anyway the de-westernization is the is the general point yes i i think i think i think you're right i think i think it is it is basically saying de-westernization but again it is it's doing this within a very sort of privileged context so essentially we got de-westernized and decolonized, but that doesn't mean you cut off my Wi-Fi. It mean you take away my iPhone. Does it mean I, I can't do my deliveries? No, it does not. So, so it's it's very kind of banal. It's very banal. It's very privileged. I think it's a very privileged discourse. Uh, and I I just think that what we've got in the West, at least, is is really quite special. And um, you, I've lived in you know places. You don't really civilization can 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 fall apart really really quickly, and I think a lot of people don't realize how quickly it can fall apart, and then what the consequences of, of that are. Um, so I so I think it is about de-westernization, but in a very kind of privileged and playful uh, uh, sense. I think if most of these activists or most of these people that are pushing these ideas, what they should really do is maybe go go and live outside the West. And then, you know, put ultimately put the money where their mouth is. is you know, it's interesting that most of the most people pushing these ideas tend to have very, very nice, cushy numbers, cushy jobs in in often very, very nice uh, universities. So, so it's kind of that that would be my thing on Robert's point about the the knowledge. So you said about the rejection of universalism, right? So I, I think I think that essentially 
what these ideas really draw from is this kind of it draws from, as I said, sort of post-structural, post-modernist ideas. So it's let it, so it would absolutely reject this idea of, of universal truth. In fact, it, it would reject truth altogether. So as ultimately, it's a sort of social constructivist epistemology. I don't want to get too complicated philosophically, but ultimately, it says there's no there's no such thing as truth. You know, there's no such thing that exists outside of our our, our systems of meaning. Ultimately, so it's fundamentally it's epistemologically relativist. Right, so it's ju- and it's, but it's also ju- with judgmentally uh, ju- ju- judgmental relativist as well. In other words, we, you, not only is, ever, is all knowledge relative, but you can't judge any any other knowledge essentially as, as more true. No, no, no knowledge has more validity than than than. than uh, uh, so it's essentially that that's the key claim is a sort of judgmental relativism, which is a very odd one and a very dodgy one. So, for example, again, you wouldn't you wouldn't go to a brain surgeon or you wouldn't go into a hospital and say, well, I tell you what, I, I'm not going to use the doctor here. I want to use the person making the sandwich to do this operation. Of course, there's there's a kind of hierarchy of knowledge, but so it's judgmental relativism. relativism I think we have a another question. I'm going to pass on to you, which is: uh, Do you think it is a tool for the destruction of identity? Again, I think this is something that you that you did touch on, um, uh, and I suppose part of the question is why, in particular countries, as you said, it's particularly in Anglo in English speaking countries. So uh, why in those countries, and and is this perhaps deliberately, or if, even if not deliberately, is this is this a, a way of of destroying a, a common identity? I, I think it is, but I, I think it is, but I, I wouldn't say I, I, I wouldn't posit that this is it's consp- it's conspiratorial right here. I don't think it, I don't think it's that organised or it works in that way. But it doesn't mean the effects of it aren't the same i.e. the destruction of identity or destruction of social cohesion you can ha- you can have a you can have a political outcome without, without necessarily an organizing committee so I, I wouldn't see it i wouldn't see it in 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 those kind of strictly instrumental terms um uh, in, but but i think it definitely uh, it does lead to a lack of social cohesion uh and uh the, the potential uh, rise of resentment and as I, as I tried to allude to at the end, if we are entering into a period where we're moving out of the kind of the, the post-war institutional settlement and the right and now the rise of greater international economic competition and great power competition, military competition, potentially, uh, both in Europe, but also in East Asia, for example, we are going to enter into a kind of a harder time. And so therefore, then, what what is the glue that holds the West together? What is it? What is it? What is this kind of what is this kind of common narrative, this common story that helps to cohere? I mean, during the Cold War, we had the kind of anti-communism. And it was kind of it worked because obviously the Soviet Union was real and, it, you know, it was very powerful. So now so now what's that story? What's the story we can tell ourselves about our, our role in, 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 in place? The second point I'd make as well is a lot of this stuff is really imported from America. So, we, I mean, I'm a great fan of America. I, I think it's a fantastic country, but I'm, I really do feel the last couple of years in particular that we really need to develop some degree of relative autonomy from America's cultural exports. Uh, we, we import a lot of this stuff from America, this kind of racial discourses and stuff like this. And I think that's, it's having a very kind of negative and malign effect on, on a country like the UK, which is very different from America. We have our own history, a very different kind of setup here. So I think that that's part of it too, which again, final point, that's an irony, isn't it? Most people that champion these, these ideas tend to see themselves on the progressive left. They're, 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 they're sort of championing the ideas ultimately of America, which they see, again, they're seen as a highly oppressive. So it's kind of, a, it's an interesting irony there. Um, another question, rather interesting question, a, a somewhat long question, so I'm going to paraphrase it uh, from another one of our other uh, listeners that he, he thinks, he talks about the importance of agency and that how much of this popular narrative uh, denies the, the role of agency to anyone who's not European. And uh, he, he, he mentions the, um, the TV series Roots in which the prototypical African slave is taken off the beach rather than bought from African slave owners. And, and as he says, you argue the evil agency of the West as central to the whole decolonizing discourse is denying the ability of other societies to make their own history which i rather guess that you agree with but i mean is this is this is this part of the aim is it a sort of excuse because you know if you're I, saying, I, I, 
you know, we, we can't blame African countries for any of this because basically we're, we're sort of on their side. So we are perfectly willing to deny them agency and regard them as helpless and passive because that, that, that um, um, uh, as it were, um, makes them innocent of any, of any participation in what we think is bad. Yeah, I, I think I completely agree. I think that's part of one of my big drives for this is, is it, I just think the infantilization of the decolonizing and, and broader wokery is very, it, both domestically, it's kind of the therapeutic authoritarianism where it's coddled and it's kind of politics of, of like, uh, you know, grievance and vulnerability. You, know, you, can, you can do these highly liberal things and authoritarian things because these are vulnerable populations. If we don't, they're going to hurt themselves or they're going to get, they're going to hurt your feelings. It's a very dangerous, that's a very, and we've seen that it's almost become ubiquitous across British politics now. So you absolutely got that. But, but I, I think also, it, I, I completely agree. I think the treating uh, non-Western and non-European peoples, cultures, states, and civilizations, almost like children, like they're only ever acted upon by by Europeans. And I think that's a really quite odd thing. If you read Edward Said, I mean, he did it, it's an interesting book, Orientalism, right? But again, it's all about kind of Western, uh, you, he leaves out, I mean, and he says, he says, he basically, uh, he says, the reason I've not looked at other empires is because essentially I'm from uh, the, the, the Palestine, uh, but, but I also, but there's, there's more of a literary tradition in 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 the anglophone west therefore i've got more sources to call upon but that's that that, that but that and, and so he's like you know the, one of the major theorists of the post-colonial and decolonizing uh, 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 I, I, theorists right so so that that's interesting i mean you 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 look you look i mean you, you talk about slavery transatlantic slavery is, is has a popular you know very strong in popular consciousness as it rightly should right it's a, it's a incredibly important part of history no doubt about that right but then you ask how people know about Barbary slavery when Europeans, I mean, uh, you know, were, were, were taken off, off the beaches of Cornwall, millions, a, a million plus were taken and stolen by the Barbary pirates, right? That's not, that's really not that common knowledge. That's, so it's an, it's an odd thing. And, and, and so it, and all the Ottoman Empire swept across huge parts of Eastern Europe, colonized huge parts of Eastern Europe, massive slave system there, and we can go on and on and on. So I think I think you're, I think the person asked the question is absolutely right. I think there is this kind of danger of infantilization and this kind of Eurocentric narcissism where we constantly make the West at the center of world history. And we're not the center of world history. There are other people, states, cultures out there that we should respect and see the and see the, the world history in this diverse richness. Um, one of our one of our audience mentioned microaggression, as, as you did too, and I suppose that is, in some ways, sums up this infantilization. You know, you, we're not talking about real aggression; we're talking about largely imaginary aggression. And indeed, I was, uh, I, I admit, it, this kept me awake at night when I got a circular from the uh, authorities in my own university, which was saying to students from ethnic minorities, "You may not be aware; you probably haven't noticed that you've been the victim of microaggressions, but think about it." Think about it very carefully, and you'll probably find out that you have been. So, people who are not who are not who are not aware of their victimhood were being encouraged to invent it. Really, is what it comes down to. But um, questions are coming rather thick and fast now. So, if you, it, it, we'll, we'll carry on if we may for a, for a, well, we've got a, a few minutes if you're if we're all okay with that. No problem. Uh, yeah, one yeah. Um, one question is about the, how how would you explain the lack of moral backbone amongst trustees? and so on mm -hmm. ceos etc that's one question i'll give i'll give you another one too um what are the uh, you know what are the what are the, the apologizers for example companies what are they supposed to do uh, do they owe something to people who were in the past victims uh, wh what's the use in apologizing for actions that people um who no longer exist did indeed did them to people who no longer exist too so it's about apology. What's the effect of apology? What about the lack of moral backbone among those who are often doing the, these apologies? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that's a really interesting uh, point, isn't it? The lack of moral backbone. Um, I think I think it comes down to um, a, a range of things. I, I, I've been quite prominent in the last couple of years. I seem to have emerged as somebody as kind of done stuff on decolonizing the curriculum i've done stuff on academic freedom i've seemed to have emerged as somewhat of a sort of people you know 
within that space that kind of like pushing back against some of this what i think is highly liberal and authoritarian the sort of ideas that we see now that are quite ubiquitous across the uk um uh, so I, I i and every time i speak or do something i get afterwards i get hundreds of emails right from people all across the country uh and say oh doug i really liked what you said and I agree with everything you said, by the way, but I, I can't say it in my own workplace. I call them I call them uh, work I call them uh, email liberals, right? <laughs> so they kind of they, they email me, right? Uh, and I, I, you know, and I, and I think people are becoming a bit more aware and and they're pushing back a bit more now, right? But I think it's uh it's it's a range of things. I think that um it's just you want a quiet life. And so you can sort of you can sort of virtue signal fairly easily, and so I, I think I think that I think that's part of it. Um, I think that there is also a large uh, uh, role that, that that university education has played in this. We've we've churned out millions of social science and humanities graduates, uh, and I think it's fair to say that this the, these ideas really form the sort of the Gramscian hegemonic common sense. Of large parts of the social science and humanities, um, you know, the, I, I think that the fairly kind of politically homogenous. But I think I think that that's that's part of it too. Um, but I think that yeah. So I think I, I, I don't know if that, that kind of answers the question, but that's yeah. You know, I think it's I think it's complicated, but it's, it's a range of all those factors. I mean, I suppose part of the answer might be to to the person who asked the question about what's the what you know what's the point of apologising is that indeed there is now a growing demand. It comes and it goes, but it seems to be coming at the moment for 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 reparations. Do you think this is a significant movement, and is it something that we shall have to somehow try to deal with? Of course, climate change reparations are in the news recently, but there are also demands for reparations from a number of of states. Well, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on on those, but I mean, but it's an odd one, right? So, uh, wh where do you stop? So, I mean, you so you, what you're going to do is you're going to take tax, pack, you're going to take money from hardworking families, right? The vast majority of this country, right, come from very poor peasant stock. Go back 200 years, most of them are in fields or in urban slums, right? The vast majority of the country are like that. Uh, so, you, so you're going to take, so the descendant had nothing to do with slavery, made no money from slavery, were often in their graves by the age of 40 years old, right? So you're going to take, you're going to take the money from the hardworking families that now struggling with cost of living crisis, you're going to take the money from them and give them, give, give that money to states uh, like, for example, Nigeria, which itself is composed of various sub-states, which are also directly involved in slavery. You see what I mean? So, so it's 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 a it's a it's a real hard one to sort of square. Uh, good luck with that politically. I think that um, it's a very odd thing. Again, it's like it, if you if you if somebody wanted to go to uh, a family that made directly money from from transatlantic slave trade, you can make an argument there. Uh, but to, to to again generalize to socialize this, and then and then I, where's my check from Libya? I want to I want some money from Libya. I mean, uh, or you know, what, what, where where do you, where do you stop? I mean, it, it, given the, the ubiquitous nature of extraterritorial conquest, slavery throughout human history, where where do you stop? You know, well, I do, 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 do I, yeah. no, I was just going to say it takes us back, I suppose, really to one of your first points, which is that if you can argue that Britain's wealth today, I mean, our collective wealth, because we're richer than. Jamaica, I suppose we're richer per capita than Nigeria, you could say, well, all your wealth is based on slavery. And therefore, you as a collective, you know, as a nation, owe us a lot of money. As you were saying, um, well, I mean, I won't repeat what you said, except that the, 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 the influence of slavery on the economy was, was, was very small. But then that's surely that's part of the importance of that argument that's now being made very strongly by some people. Yeah, I mean, essentially, I mean, again, I'm not an academic historian, right? But I've done, a, I've done a, for the book, I did a lot of research, a chapter dedicated to history, I did a lot of research on that. I'm sure you could tell a better story than I could, Robert. And your, your, your guests in later weeks will do a lot, a lot of better job than I will do. But the, the scholarship seems pretty categorical that, that essentially uh, uh, industrialization, the, the benefits from transatlantic slavery, whilst a tiny elite, elite did, that wasn't aggregated or generalized across across the British economy. I mean, think think for example about the the, 
the, um, the the role of slavery in, in, in the West Indies is primarily about the cultivation of sugar. So I think, is it Mocha, M-O-K-Y-R? I think he did a very interesting mm. book on that. He's a very well-established academic historian. And so well, essentially, if you took that out, then essentially the elites at the time would have non-sweetened tea. Uh, but it would it's not it wouldn't be absolutely fundamental i mean what what basically made the british economy was that the sort of cer- certain sets of complements of ideas certain other other elements within british society but in terms of commodities and resources it's primarily coal tin agri- agricultural products not sugar which was marginal at best i mean i say uh, just quote again El- eltis and engelman in relation to the british wealth said the most, 1790 was the most significant year of the trans- transatlantic slave trade they, you know, 1.5% of British ships and 3% of tonnage were involved in the slave trade. They, and this is a direct quote, if economic activity on so modest a scale could contribute significantly to industrialization, then we might expect Europe's first industrial economy to have been Portugal, not Britain. Portugal was a much bigger slave state. If slavery is really the key accelerant to wealth, and slavery has been ubiquitous throughout human history, why aren't all the other slave states out there? Why, why isn't Libya now? rolling in dosh why isn't nigeria rolling in dosh you see what i mean so so slavery per se is not is not the accelerant of uh of wealth uh we're quite i mean i i, I agree with that oh lots of questions coming in um i'm go- we, we we may not have time to do to deal with all of them but we still have another five or minutes or so Thank you. Now, you, someone is making a suggestion, which I think is in some ways very interesting, but I just wonder how you could do it. Anyway, the, the suggestion is that we should we should place less emphasis on um, historic slavery. And as, as you did in, in part of your talk, focus much more on the people who are suffering from slavery in the world today. Yeah. Yeah. But then I suppose that doesn't serve that doesn't serve the interests of the people who are pushing the decolonization. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I mean, if, if if we are genuinely concerned about human betterment, then we then I think our efforts, whilst we always have to recognise the role of history, including transatlantic slavery in the history of this country, surely our efforts are much better put into dealing with contemporary slavery. I mean, uh, I think I think Mauritania, Qatar, I think like India, which is a country I think is an amazing country, credible culture. Etc. But India has the largest slave population, not least because it's got a massive population. But India, I think, today has some like eight eight million official slaves, according to the various slavery indexes, etc. And that's before you even look at the caste system in India, the Dalit system, etc., which itself is, is a quote unquote an interesting system. So absolutely, I mean, but then how? But then how do you do about that? I mean, this is this is the interesting dynamic we've seen in the Qatar thing, right? Um, on the one hand. These people claim to be anti-imperialist. They want to decolonize all this stuff. But essentially, they are ultimately championing the sort of progressive imperialism, mainly American-centric imperialism. You know, the kind of the, the value set, if you buy the idea that there are different cultural interpretations, they are pushing a very kind of culturally specific worldview, right? So if you go to Qatar, which is a very conservative Islamic state, essentially you're pushing your own imperialism on them, right? When you're talking about LGBT rights or you're talking about anti-slavery what give if, if you buy the postmodern argument what gives you the right to go to qatar and tell them that their slavery is bad and or they should be uh, they should accept your views on homosexuality is that not a process of if, if everything's about contestation and knowledge and there's no such thing as truth and everything's judgmentally relativist what right do you have to tell qatar that they shouldn't be doing what they're doing this is where you start to get into that really sort of dodgy territory right well, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah, sh- sure. Well, as I said earlier, it's as if they're saying, "Well, no, nobody has any nobody has any truth except our truth." Uh, it's not mm-hmm. a it's not a very rigorous or honest way of proceeding. But and as you say, it's it's you know people are not. It seems to be worried about slavery. They're worried about a particular kind of slavery. Mm-hmm. Part of mm-hmm. that, and this is another question from from the audience. What what do you think about the argument that's often heard is that uh, the the Atlantic slavery, chattel slavery, as, as practiced in the Atlantic economy, is is just far worse than other forms of slavery. Uh, I mean, I've always thought it's dodgy to talk about good and bad forms of slavery, but I wonder what you think about that. 
Well, I think I think that's an. I mean, I I, I wouldn't want to get into that because it, morally, I think it's. I mean, transatlantic slavery is morally repugnant, and how I mean, to compare the, the human suffering of that on that scale with the human suffering, for example, of the Arab slave trade throughout Africa that predated the European, or to to compare that to Barbary slavery. And one of the first things the Barbary slavers ever did when they got when they took men in particular, they castrated them. The, the galley slaves, the galley ships, you know, were literally like whipping across the back. They exposed the spine and throw them in the sea and get rid of them. The first thing they did was cut, was, was, I don't, don't go too far, but they castrated them to pacify yeah. them, basically. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's, I, I wouldn't want to get down that line because I think it's a bit, it's morally very dubious. I, I think we should recognize the horror of it all. Uh, but rather, you know, so I think, I think, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I, I guess had, had, had most of us had the choice, we would probably have gone for the plantation rather than uh, rather than castration. Uh, and of course, for women, uh, sex slavery, in mm. effect. Um, yeah. You yeah. know, it's often, sometimes some people do say, "Oh well, you know, it was okay really because if they had a baby, then they'd be you know they'd be better treated and so on." And the men, after all, could become civil servants and all the rest. But you might think it's rather rather a steep price to pay. Well, I mean, I, I don't. I, I, again, I'm not an academic historian on 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 in, in this specific area, so I hesitate to say this. But you do often see, we, we, for example, it's very common within the academic literature when you look at, for example, uh, Islamic slavery, ubiquitous, very common, right? They, they, they don't really analyze it in such moral terms or, or deconstruct it, if you will, because they say, well, the slaves could rise through the system. That tends to basically be so. It was, Essentially, Arab uh, Islamic slavery was more benign, whereas Western slavery was far, far worse. So again, so you, you do get that kind of moral, moral uh, uh, sort of grey area in the academic literature. But you could say the same about, you know, even the, the, the plantation slaveries. In, in, you know, you, you had um, house slaves; they were treated a lot better. Uh, some slaves, black slaves, were free, then they ended up owning slaves in in the, in the American South, for example. So again, it's like uh, it. So I, I have seen that in the academic literature vis-a-vis the Arab slave trade. The argument is kind of more benign because slaves could occasionally rise up. Well, I don't know, tell to a galley slave, I don't know, or whoever. I, I think you're right, yeah. Yes. Uh, now, we're going to have to come to the end of, I think we've dealt with most of the questions, not, not every one, but most of the questions that our audience have asked. So thank you very much, all those who contributed your ideas and your questions. And, and I want to actually be coming up very neatly to the end of our, our scheduled time, which is an hour. We weren't sure we would actually go on for an hour, but thank, thanks to all the questions and to the interest that Doug has inspired, we, we've done exactly that. So I want to thank you very much, Doug, for having led us in our first webinar. Thank you to all those who participated. Uh, we are, well, you will find the rest of uh, the, the schedule for our present series of seminars on our website and you're very welcome of course to come to the next one too to all of them and next year we plan to have a longer series of webinars on the history of slavery the universal history of slavery when we'll be going in in more detail into some of the things that Doug's been talking about slavery in the Arab world slavery in Asia also indigenous slavery in the Americas and so on and of course in Africa and uh, and then we shall probably, um, if we haven't all run out of pa patience, we'll probably have a series on the history of race, because as Doug was saying earlier, it's often said that, in fact, people do say this very specifically, that race was a European invention of the 18th century, or it was a, it was something that grew out of the of the slave trade, the Atlantic slave trade, and we're going to look at the history of race over a long period and see whether this accusation is true. So for now, um, thank you um, and, um, and, and au revoir on behalf of History Reclaimed. Thank you again, Doug, and we look forward to seeing you at, at our future webinars. Good night, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.